Jean-Dominique Bobie's memoir, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, epitomizes the distinction discussed in the week one lecture between a body and a person. A victim of locked-in syndrome, Bobie appears outwardly to be nothing more than a body, a vegetable, as he puts it in the title of one of his chapters, incapable of any voluntary bodily movement aside from the fluttering of his left eyelid. One of the themes of his memoir is the impression he must leave on the people who look at him and who see only an immobile, corpse-like shell. Less incapacitated patients see him as an object of pity. His friends are variously appalled or titillated. Several of the healthcare professionals he describes see him as just another source of perfunctory jobs that need to be done. And his family, and even Bobby himself, have a difficult time reconciling Bobby's locked-in body with the elegant and accomplished person he had been before his stroke. Through the art of memoir, however, Bobby provides his readers with a glimpse beyond the diving bell of his inert body and into the restless and wide-ranging butterfly of his thoughts. As Bobby explains in the chapter The Alphabet, he dictated his memoir to his friend Claude the only way he could, blinking his eyelid in a code that may require as many as 26 blinks for one letter, if the letter is W, which thankfully is rare in Bobby's native language of French. This painstaking labor of love on the part of both Bobby and the woman who transcribed his memoir is itself eloquent testimony of the lengths to which a person will go to express their individuality. The book itself is evidence of the triumph of the spirit against the alienation and depersonalization that his condition exposes him to. The significance of this project of letting the butterfly escape the diving bell weights every word of every sentence in Bobby's memoir with importance. A reader can discern from the tight narrative economy of Bobby's chapters and the precision and clarity of his sentences that he has considered every word of his narration very carefully, as if his life depended on every letter. And it does, really, for if his butterfly is unable to take flight, Bobby is inescapably entombed in his diving bell. Stripped of the ability to express himself, he is susceptible to the impression that he shares the fate of the living dead. He fears that he must look to his children like a zombie, as he writes in the chapter Through a Glass Darkly, or even that of an actual dead body as in his description of the way he is handled by the orderlies at the end of the chapter, The Wheelchair. The book itself is subtitled A Memoir of Life and Death. The book's most haunting depiction of this state of living death is possibly the brief vignette, My Lucky Day. Consisting of a single paragraph, the chapter begins with a topic sentence that less sets the tone for the entire piece. This morning, with the first light barely bathing room 119, evil spirits descended on my world. The watery image of the morning light combines with the image of descending spirits to suggest a sense of being underwater, drowned, and completely helpless, and Bobby proceeds to enumerate a barrage of minuscule irritations reminiscent of the torments of the damned. When the nurse finally comes in, she automatically turns the television on, confronting Bobby with the ironic question of whether he was born lucky. In Western civilization, it is every consumer's privilege to answer that question in the affirmative. Even if we are down on our luck, television advertisements extend to the viewer the potential to consider that they might turn out to be lucky after all. But these words mean something very different to Bobby than they mean to the average television viewer. For Bobby, they mock his hellish existence, even as they taunt him with the ironic implication that he is in fact lucky. He could be actually dead or brain dead, rather than being the alert, poetic, urbane, and witty consciousness we know him to be through his writing. In passages like this one, Bobby uses the art of memoir to transport his readers into his diving bell, to feel what he feels not only in terms of the physical discomforts of his condition, but more importantly, in terms of the sense in which his condition makes him feel separated from the rest of human society. Indeed, Bobby has been tragically severed from the rest of the world in an unimaginable way. In many ways, we are our bodies, and the things we choose to do with our bodies are what define us as individual human beings. Bobby's condition has unavoidably severed him from his former life, as he describes in chapters like Paris and 20 to 1, and even from his wife and children, as he describes in the book's most heartbreaking chapter, Through a Glass Darkly. The title of this chapter, a reference to the New Testament, suggests that, even with his blinking alphabet, he is unable to communicate with his immediate family in many of the most important ways. They only see a dim reflection of who he really is. There is a dark mirror, mirror or window, a glass, between him and his loved ones. The craft of memoir, however, provides a unique opportunity for Bobby to smash through the dusty mirror and to reveal his inner life. The inner life he reveals, naturally, has a slightly different texture from what we may recognize from more conventional memoirs. Whereas most memoirs depict events that happen over a course of time, Bobby's impressionistic episodes confuse any straightforward notion of the passage of time. We get the impression that Bobby's own perception takes place as a collage of impressions, rather than as an ordinary sequence of cause and effect. In most people's lives, time and the body are two of the most important coordinates in understanding our reality. 
But for Bobi, reality itself seems mutable and ambiguous. Many of Bobi's chapters describe fantasies, the Empress, Senesita, dreams, dream, wax museum, or waking dreams, message. In coincidence, Bobi considers the possibility that ironic fate has condemned him to become a minor character in one of his favorite works of fiction. In Mythmaker, he remembers the tall tales that his childhood friend used to tell, and suggests that perhaps the inner life of the imagination does have a kind of truth that may be truer in its own way than the consensus view of what is actually true. In place of sensations, Bobi has memories of sensations. Instead of experiences, he has memories of experiences. The vividness of his descriptions and the clarity of his language, however, suggests that Bobi's inner world of phantoms and thoughts has a solid reality of its own, a conclusion that challenges us to reconsider our own assumptions about what is real for an individual human being. Through his memoir, Bobi both expresses his own humanity and invites his readers to empathize with individuals in extreme states of physical distress or incapacity.